good afternoon, and nice to see you all again. And uh, we thank God for bringing us to this time. Uh, we've been talking about right versus might, and uh, this afternoon we're going to talk about the all-sufficient Savior, the all-sufficient Savior. And, uh, and if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and have another word of prayer. Father, we, we come to you now. Uh, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to Calvary's cross I cling. Oh, hide me behind your cross, dear God, and may Christ alone be lifted up, and may be our all-sufficiency. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, um, so what, what are we talking about here? As you, as you, as you follow uh, the presentations from this uh, weekend, you're going to realize that uh, there is a, you know, it, it kind of ties in together. And, um, and, and what we are trying to say is, as, as, as the times are getting harder and harder, and uh, you know, men's hearts are filling them for fear, we also understand that we have a never failing helper. And, um, and we, could be, um, we could take heart, we could take courage in the midst of, of, of the calamities and the storms um, that we, uh, we have a God who does not leave us. And, um, and so, um, you know, uh, we have this statement uh, that we, we, we are very familiar with, um, that, that we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led and his teachings in our past history. So um, I do have some slides, okay. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so um, here we have a statement here um, from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And the Bible tells us that God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the, the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 15. Then, God, then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And this is, um, this is, this is God being right. Yes, this is God being right. And uh, uh, God is always right. Uh, and the rightness of God is his love, right? Because, because, because he, he wants to save us and spare us from, 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 from trouble and, and, and harm. And so, um, and so God makes us in his own image. Uh, and that word man, as you, as you see here, it's highlighted. Uh, th that word man, we know, is Adam, right? Adam or mankind. All men in one man. Man's representative. And so when God made Adam, he made all men in him. And so... Um, so here we see in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man, and the man, Adam, said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And verse 25 tells us, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and call them mankind. See, God made man in his image and likeness because God wanted us to be as he is, right? He wanted us to have the same character that he has. And, um, and if, uh, if only, if only we, had, we had believed God. And so, um, and so here, 
We see what might looks like, yes? We see what might, might, well, what does might look like? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said to the, um, to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now we all know that God never said that. Yes? But you see how just by just a little tweak, uh, you could actually misinterpret and, uh, and, and twist God's words. So the, uh, and then we understand now, we jump over to verse 4, because the woman, the woman begins to dialogue with the serpent, as we all know. And we um, say, no, no, God did not say that. God says we should not touch the tree or whatever. You know, anyway, verse 4 tells us, then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. What did God say? You shall surely die. So verse 6 tells us, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took off its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then, now that word then means at that very moment, okay, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sowed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. This, my friends, is the beginning of sorrows for humanity. Yes? Believing what the serpent said over believing what God said. Now we understand that it was Adam who was not deceived. The woman was deceived, right? She was the one who believed what the, what, uh, the serpent said. Now, Adam, we understand, he just went along with his wife because he was too, um, well, uh, he was unbelieving as well. He would not believe God. He would rather want to be with this woman, yes, than to be with God. He could have believed God and trusted God to be God because his character is love and God would have done what God would have done. Right? But he decided that he was going to believe his wife instead. So he ate of the fruit. And immediately, this thing called guilt came upon them, which resulted in shame, which was exactly what God was trying to keep from them. But now it was too late. And now they, they have to sow fig leaves, filthy rags, right? Filthy rags. It doesn't do. Fig leaves do not cut it. And so, now we see where the trouble began. And uh, now we look at God's intent. God's intent and Satan's, in Satan's intent. Now we read from four selected messages. Um, we read that the knowledge which God did not want our first parents to have was a knowledge of what? Of guilt. And when they accepted the assertions of Satan, which were false, disobedience and transgression were introduced into our world. So we recognize that God is right, yes? But the devil, Satan, he wants to use might to do right. But he cannot do right because right only comes from the heart of God. Now we know that Satan means the accuser, right? You know, we also know that Satan actually means one who looks down on. Yes? God looks at us with a look of love, of kindness. Satan looks down on us because he wants to destroy us. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So let's look at the consequences of the action that they took. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. And they heard the voice or the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, 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 we just read a little while ago that God made man in his own image and his own, his, his own likeness. But now we see here a transition. Now we see man running away and hiding from God, which means that man's character has now changed, has now shifted from what God is like 
to what the serpent is like. And so we read that the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. Oh friends, fear does not come from God. Perfect love casts out fear. But Adam, his mind now has been twisted. And this, and the one who was his good friend, the one who, 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 who loves him, the one who, who, who has only good intentions for him, has now become his enemy. He said, because I was naked and I hid myself. And, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now, did God know that Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree? Yes, he knew that, right? But, but here is the goodness of God. Because the goodness of God always leads men to repentance. And God was seeking a repentant heart from Adam. But what did Adam say? He said, the woman whom you gave me, you are responsible for this thing. This is where might becomes always shifting the blame. Because I'm going to protect myself. And so we understand that he said, yes, I have eaten of that tree, but the woman gave it to, gave, gave it to me. And so um, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, and I hid myself. And so verse 12 tells us, then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, well, the serpent Deceive me, and I ate. If you did not create the serpent, I, I'm sure up to this time, Eve had not met a talking serpent. But now he's accusing God of creating a talking serpent. So the serpent whom you created deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, now notice that the Lord did not ask the serpent a question. The Lord knows the source of this trouble. He knows the heart of Satan who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So he went directly with the judgment. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And so... We see something happen here which is just beautiful. As we go to Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, we see something here which, which Adam and Eve did not expect. Because they expected severe punishment, yea, the severest of punishments, which is death, instant death. But here's what God said, an unexpected love. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first time in all of humanity that the gospel message was declared. And this is right because God is love. And so Adam and Eve they were amazed that God would rather provide a remedy for their transgression than to send them into everlasting damnation. And so we see here Adam's consequence. Adam's consequence, uh, verse, verse 17. Then God said to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, not my voice, you have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, you shall, uh, saying you shall not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it, and all the days of your life, in your sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And that, my friends, was the consequence of Adam yielding to his wife's temptation. You see, you understand that... Uh, you know, how many of you have, have seen a, 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 some type of fire, like a house fire, or, or, or maybe this is California, trees on fire? How many of you have seen that? Uh, if you see something on fire, what do you do? Like a house, what do you do? You call 
the fire department, right? And they come and they try to spray and put out the fire. The, 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 this is not what happened here. It was not God see trouble and then God says, whoa, 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 I better call the fire department. No, 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 no. Before there was sin, there was grace. Before there was sin, there was a savior. So that the moment Adam and Eve sinned, the rescue plan was already in place. God did not have to call the fire department. He did not have to come up with plan B. He already had a plan. Because in making man, in creating man, he gave man what? Free choice. And, and it is a painful thing. Those of us who are parents, you know, I try to give my, my kids free choice from time to time. <laughs> it is a hard thing to give free choice, but love demands it. And so hearing is right. Adam and Eve were given free choice. And they chose to eat of the fruit. But God already had a plan because God knows that free choice demands expecting anything to happen. And so here's what we read here from, um, from, um, from H.E. Jones. H.E. Jones tells us, um, says, but the Lord spoke otherwise. Before this deceiver spoke, the Lord had said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And this was the truth. It was the truth when he spoke it. It was the truth the day that they ate of the tree. And it is the truth forever. And the only reason, this is so important, the only reason that Adam and Eve did not die in the very hour that they ate is that Jesus Christ stepped in between. Can somebody say amen? And took upon himself the curse of sin and its penalty of death. And this he did in order that mankind might be delivered from the death into which they had plunged by that one man. Therefore, since Jesus stepped in between and he himself received the stroke of death that must come upon the man the day he sinned, and since the Lord Jesus did this solely in order that the man might have the opportunity to receive life instead of death, it became essential and in the gift of Christ that that, that day it was given that the man and all mankind should have support sufficient space in which to breathe to allow them to live long enough to fix each his choice of life or death. And this, my friends, is the reason why liberty of conscience is so big with God. Because he wants us to be able to make choices freely. And he gives us the time to make those choices. He doesn't beat up on us. He doesn't call us names. He gives us choices. He informs our choice. But he gives us choices. And so the question then we ask, my friends, is who dies? Who dies? Because you shall surely die. Who dies? Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16. The father shall not be put to death for his children, nor shall the children be put to death for the fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. Ezekiel 18, 22. The soul that sins, what happens to it? It shall surely die. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is what? It's death. Oh, but thank God that the gift of God is eternal life. So what then, my friends, gives Jesus the right to die for humanity? If the righteous, if the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him, why is Jesus dying for you and for me? Why? Some people have called this legal fiction. The Muslims 
they, they, they laugh at us. They laugh at us. They're like, what, what are you talking about? That, that somebody who, some, some, your God came down. I mean, he had nothing to do with this. Yes, and this Jesus, he had nothing to do with anything. And, and all of a sudden now he's dying for you. That doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't. Because we just read that the soul that sins, that soul is the one that dies. And so we read in Genesis chapter 25, verse 22. You see, you see, you see legal fiction is making something up. But we don't need to make anything up here today because God has given us his word. And in his word, we have something called biblical solidarity. And so in Genesis chapter 25, verse 22, let us look at a couple of verses here that, that, that explain. This is an Eastern mind concept, and the Bible was written within that Middle East concept. Yes? And we, you know, I come from Africa, so we have that same type of idea. You know, we have that community. Right? Solidarity. And so we read in Genesis 25, 22, but the children struggled together within her. Rebecca, in, in other words, remember Rebecca was, uh, was barren and Isaac prayed and the Lord answered their prayer and, and she became pregnant. And so she now had two children in her womb, but she didn't know that. And so she was wondering why they were struggling within her. If, if God is so good to me, why is this happening to me? So she inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said, said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now let me ask you a question. How many people were in Rebecca's womb? Now, I'm a physician, so I'm, I'm asking a question from a medical point of view, Dr. Kingsley. How many people? Two people, right? But, but God did not say that. God said two nations are in your womb. What, 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 what are you talking about? Two peoples are in your womb. And so here we see the concept of biblical solidarity that we in the Western world do not seem to understand. Because God is saying to Rebecca, in your womb, I have formed, yes, two separate nations that will come from these two men. But, but these two nations are already in these two men who are in your womb. So God is saying that all men in one man, like in a dam, is what biblical solidarity is. When God made man, he made all men in him. That is why he is called mankind, the representative man. In him was the seed that would multiply and bring the rest of humanity to, uh, to be. And so he said two peoples. Now we don't have any record that, uh, that, um, that Esau right, served Jacob. No record in the Bible, none. But we do have record in the Bible that the people, the Edomites, yes, from Esau, we have record that they did serve and they did, they, they did pay obeisance to Israel at several times. And so God is saying that this is the case with what happened when I made man a dam. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 7. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mother man receives tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes, some Bibles say through, but really it is in Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So when Melchizedek met Abraham, after Abraham came back from, 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 from winning the battle, yes, he paid tithe to Melchizedek, a tenth, didn't he? Where was Levi? He wasn't there. He wasn't even thought, I mean, first of all, <laughs> We're talking here about Abraham. So, 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 so Isaac wasn't even, wasn't even, wasn't even, wasn't even, yeah. For, I mean, forget about Jacob and Esau. There was no Isaac. And yet and still, God is saying 
that Levi paid tithe in Abraham to Melchizedek. Remember, Levi was the, was the earthly priesthood, and people paid tithe to the Levites. Now we're talking about the lesser Levi, who was way down the line, paying tithe to Melchizedek, the better, in Abraham, who was like the great, great grandfather. And this again, my friends, is biblical solidarity. It's a beautiful concept, but it's a concept that is very hard to understand from the human mindset. But this is what gives Jesus Christ the right to die for us because he is called the second Adam. Really, there is the last Adam because there's no other Adam that came from him. Just like how the first Adam was mankind, all men in one man, so is it that the second Adam or the last Adam, who now becomes the new representative of the human race, also carries the title of mankind, all men in one man. This is biblical solidarity. And so as we look at Romans chapter 5, what do we see? We see a train wreck that was caused by the first Adam, which he passed on to all men, and we see a rescue mission. Remember the fire hose? The fire hose was already ready to go in full swing before the fire came. So Jesus Christ was on a rescue mission. And so we read in Romans chapter 5 or 6, For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We were without strength, my friends. That's what Adam did to us. You know, people always ask, well, why, why did God put so much on Adam? Because Adam was the one that God created in his own image and likeness to be the progenitor of all of mankind. And so he was responsible for the human race. He was the prince of the earth, to, to care for the earth, to have dominion over everything. But he subjected himself to be deceived or to be lied to by a woman. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. And this righteous man is a man that, uh, that uh, you, know, he, he's so, you know, he's so pious, so holy, you know, he doesn't bother anybody. He, 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 he's careful to be moral and to be right. Scarcely one would die for such a man. Yet perhaps for a good man, that, 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 that kind, benevolent man who, 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 is always, who is always helping over here, helping over there. For maybe somebody might want to die for him. You know, we all know the story of, uh, of Admetus and Alcestis. We know that uh, Admetus was a good man, wasn't he? And Admetus, we understand that, you know, people loved him. People really liked him. But, but he got himself into trouble where, where the sentence was death. And this is, this is Greek mythology, by the way. The sentence was death. Uh, but but, but he, he was lucky enough that, 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 that there, was, there was an agreement that if somebody would step up to die for him because he was such a good man, that that would be acceptable. And so they began to find that, to look around, who will die for admitters? And, that, and nobody will die for admitters. Even his own parents would not, would not, would not die for him. But his wife, Alcestis, she said, no, he is a good man. I love him so much. I will die for him. That is as far as human love goes. That is not God's love. Many times we have the perception that this is the way God loves us. Oh, no. God demonstrates his own love. No, not, not my. We, we, we always bring God down to our love. He demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we are still sinners. Not, not good people, not good at two shoes, not, 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 not righteous people. No, 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 no. Christ did not come for righteous people. Christ does not come for righteous people because righteous people do not need a savior. Why were we still sinners? Christ died for us. 
why we had the biased life. You know what the biased life is? We talk about biology, the study of life. This is the life that dies. This is the life that dies. This is the life that, uh, that, um, that, 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 that we all have without Christ. Even though Christ is the one who makes the biased life possible, but he came to give us life more abundant. The Zoe life. That is the life of God. The life that Adam and Eve had before sin. And so that is the life he came to give us. So Christ came to die for us by crucifying the biased life that he could give us the Zoe life. Can somebody say amen? First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 45. The first man, that word man, anthropos. Yes? Anthropos. We have, uh, we have anthropology, the study of, of man. So the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Christ came that we may have life and that we may have such a life more abundantly. I don't know how many of us want life, abundant life. We could be satisfied with our biased life. We could be satisfied to just, well, I'm just surviving. But that's, that's not the life that Christ came to give us. But if we think that we are doing just fine, if we think that we, are, we, 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 we come to church, we, we, we teach Sabbath school, we, we, we get to preach, we sing in the choir, we, we, we're doing all these lovely things, if we, we, we follow the health message, we only eat vegan, we don't wear jewelry, we, we dress, follow dress reform, if we think that we are doing good, and we don't need Jesus. We shall die in our sins. Because he came to save his people from their sins. If we go to our Bibles, let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 18 and 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18 and 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 18, 21. This is, this is a beautiful uh, piece of scripture here. What do we have? What do we have? Second Corinthians 5, 18 to, and 21. It says here, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So God himself reconciled man to himself. Verse 21 says, For he who... Uh, he, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is God doing this. This is God doing all of it. It is God's initiative. God took the initiative to do good to us while we were still sinners, while we were still without help, while we were still enemies of him. And so we are told much more than having been justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Remember this. Remember this. That we were enemies to God when Christ reconciled us to God. And he did so through death. So if Christ could reconcile us to God through death, how much more? Would he not save us with his life? If Christ could, 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 could trample over the devil, who has the power over the grave, and he was able to arise from the grave and reconcile us back to God, how much more will he not destroy the devil and save us in his life? Oh, friends, we must believe the gospel. The gospel says we were reconciled. This is not you doing it. This is a passive tense. This is God doing it. And only God could do it well. And we need to take our hands off God's business and do only what God could do. And this is the slide, sorry, this is the slide I just read. I, um, now let's go to the next slide. And we are saved by his life. Reconciled by his death, saved by his life. And we read here from Wagner on Romans, Christ did not go through the pangs of death for nothing. 
Nor did he give his life to us for the purpose of taking it away. When he gives us his life, he designs that we shall keep it, how long? Forever. How do we get it? By faith. We have to believe this thing. We've got to believe it. Well, what is faith? Faith is believing. Yes? Faith is believing the word of God to do what it says it will do, depending upon it, and expecting God to do the thing. And if God says, I give you life by giving you Christ, believe the thing and hold on to it for dear life. How do we keep it? We get it by, the same, by faith and we keep it by the same faith. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. His life can never end, but we may lose it by unbelief. First John chapter 5, verse 12. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life. This is simple logic, simple mathematics. If you don't have the source of life, you don't have life. Now, you may be walking around and think you have life, but no. True life, abundant life, is found only in him. The much more abundant life. And so... We read here in Adam, corporate guilt. Talked about that, that biblical uh, solidarity, biblical uh, 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 oneness, a uh, corporate guilt. In Adam, we have corporate guilt. In Christ, the last Adam, we have corporate victory. Chapter 5, verse 11. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. And that word rejoice, my friends, that, that, is, that, is, that is just a, a, an overwhelming rejoicing through whom we have now received the reconciliation or at one meant. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, as he made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, by 13, but now in Christ. Talk about the in Christ motif. We have to remain in Christ because that's where God put us. You who we are once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We read, I was previously an enemy, now I am made a friend. I was previously ungodly, now I am declared righteous. I was previously helpless, now I am given power. It is not a reward, it is not a reward to the righteous, but a gift, my friends, to the guilty. How many of you are guilty today? Oh, I'm guilty, but Christ has set me free. Hallelujah. And so we rejoice in the God of our salvation this morning or this afternoon. Let's look at this one here from, um, from, from youth uh, instructor, where we read, Christ is called the second Adam in purity and holiness, connected with God and beloved by God. He began where the first Adam began. Willingly, he passed over the ground where Adam fell. He had to. He, he cannot start someplace else. He had to go where the first Adam fell and start right there because he had to gain the victory right there. And so he, redeems, he redeemed Adam's failure. Christ was tempted by Satan in a hundredfold, a hundredfold, my friends, if you are, manner than was Adam. And under circumstances in every way more trying, the deceiver presented himself as an angel of light, but Christ withstood his temptations. He redeemed Adam's disgraceful fall and saved the, the world. Excuse me. In his human nature, he maintained the purity of his divine character. Don't miss that. In his human nature. He lived the law of God and honored it in a world of transgression. Do we live right now in a world of transgression? Revealing to the heavenly universe, to Satan, and to all the fallen sons and daughters of Adam, that through his grace, covered by his blood, humanity can keep the law of God. He came to impart. He imputes into us righteousness. And then he works the thing out. We are justified, justified by his life. And we are saved.
by his life. Oh, friends, justification by faith is this what it is. We've got we to believe this thing. But it is his faith that is doing the work in us. And he came to work out in us his divine nature, his own image to the repentant, believing soul. Do we believe this today? Do we believe that in such a world as we live in today, we could live righteous lives? We could live right lives because righteousness is right doing and right doing is love. Agape love, not this foolish love we talk about in the world today. The great irony, my friends, is that Satan's purpose is to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. That was his purpose, to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ, we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. Now, now think about that for a second here. We are more closely united with God than if Adam had never fallen. Fallen. Wow! In taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, he is linked with us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. He gave him not only to bear our sins and to die as a sacrifice, he gave him to the fallen race. He gave him to you. He gave him to me. You have him now. You had him yesterday. You could have him the rest of your days. God gave his only begotten son to become one with the human family forever as the second Adam to retain his human nature. This is from Desire of Ages. This is a guarantee, my friends. This is a pledge that God makes, an assurance that he makes. You, you, you know, I could give you assurances till the ki till, till, till kingdom come. It doesn't mean anything. But when God gives you an assurance, you could believe the thing, you could hold on to it because it is sure, it is right, because he loves you and because he loves me. So, corporate solidarity, here's that term again. Therefore, therefore, just as through one man. How many men? One man. Sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all in that one man have sinned. Here is Jones again. Whoever, whosoever believes that and grasps the fact thus stated, is prepared to understand the fullness of the salvation that the Lord Jesus brought to the world. And whosoever does not grasp this thing as to recognize it constantly cannot grasp in its truth, in its sincerity, the salvation that Christ has brought. Oh, friends, we need to grasp this thing that Christ came that we may have life, but he came because that one man dumped us into sin. Here is uh, 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 Jones again. All have sinned, and death came by sin. But all of us who have sinned, sorry, but all of us who have sinned as the consequence of that which was brought to the world, because of our being in that vortex into which the world was plunged by the sin of that one man, to whom God gave the world in the beginning, by one man sin entered into the world. When sin has so entered by that one man, it was impossible <laughs> for any of his of themselves to rise above that which he has entailed. It is impossible for any of us to receive from him more than he had. How much did he have? He had everything that sin is involved with. Because he himself was a man, I mean, was a sinner. That's all he had. And that's all he could give us. And after he had sinned, sin only was that which he had. Consequently, he sunk the human race under the power of sin, in the sea of sin, and because of that sin, we all have sinned. And so death has passed upon all. When this one man sinned, death passed upon him, 
and he never could draw any of us, any of his posterity, higher than he was. Consequently, when he became subject to death by sin, we all became subject to death because being thus crippled, we all have sinned. Wow. So let's go to um, these next uh, several verses here, verses uh, 13 to, to 17. Now, now these, have some of the, uh, these have been considered to be some of the most difficult to understand uh, 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 verses of Scripture you know, in the Bible, and, uh, and it's, it, you, know, you, know, you know how Paul writes, and Paul, Paul, Paul stops at verse 12, and then he begins this, he, you know, he doesn't continue the thought right through, he, he, he interrupts himself to, to, to kind of break it down a little bit more, and so, and so here's what he says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. So, so, so here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. W was the law there before sin entered? Yes or no? Was the law there before sin entered? Was God's law there? Yes, it was. But, but, but it had not yet been codified in written form. Yes? But, but because the law was there... <laughs> Even though it could not be imputed into man, because man did not have the, 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 the written form yet, death is still the result of a broken law. And so when Adam sinned, he passed down sin unto all men, and all men are subject, therefore, to the wages of sin, which is death. And so, even though the law had not been given yet, People were still dying. And so Adam transgressed the law of God. He knew better. That's what transgression is. He knew better. But he chose to break it. It was rebellion. And the Bible says he is a type of him who was to come. Now, don't, don't, people get this confused. He, he, he is a type in the sense that he was man's representative, all men in one man. But that's it. Moving forward, he was completely different from the second Adam. Because as we see here, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more, the grace of God and the gift of the, by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like, the gift is not like, listen to this, the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. That's judgment. That's judgment. The sin that Adam passed on to us resulted in condemnation, not just for him, but for his posterity. But the free gift which came from many offenses. Now, now that's adding to his sin, our sin. Because, 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 because we, 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 we are not, the apple tree is not an apple tree because it bears apples. It, is a, it, it, it bears apples because it is an apple tree. And so we sin because we were born with a sinful nature which we got from Adam. And so our many offenses joined with his resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. How many of you want to reign in life? Oh, I want to reign in life. And it only comes not by me trying, but by me dying. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I. My life is hidden in Christ with God. The offense versus the free gift, my friends. Verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through the one man's righteous act. Oh, my goodness. That is right. Because righteousness is right doing. And right doing is agape. The free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. 
For as by one man's obedience, many will meet sinners. So also by one man's, not your obedience, not, 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 not his obedience, not mine obedience, but God's, Christ's obedience. By his obedience. In my flesh, by the way, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. By his obedience, many will be made righteous. So the question then goes, the question then is asked, do, do I sin because because uh, I sinned like Adam, or do I sin because I sinned in Adam? What do you think? Like or, I, or in? Like or in? Do I sin because I sinned like Adam, or do I sin because I sinned in the beginning in Adam? Huh? Both. Both. Yes? But it begins with the sin in Adam, yes? And then now I sin, right? And so it is with Christ. Do I obey like him or do I obey in him? Think about it. Do I, sin, do I obey like him or do I obey in him? Our friends, we believe we obey in him. Your obedience doesn't mean anything because you can't start from being a sinner and say, well, now I obey perfectly. The wages of sin is death, and if you offend in one, you offend in all. And so you cannot come now and say, well, look at me, I'm perfect, I've done everything right for the last 10 years. What happened for the years before that? Only this one man, only this one man. That's why we need him, that's why we need him. And the gift is not like the offense, and we just read that. We just read that. <clears throat> let's move forward. And so, let's look at what Wagner says here. Justification of life. The life of which we are made partakers in Christ is much stronger for righteousness than the life which we received from Adam is for unrighteousness. Wow. God does not do things in halves. He gives abundance of grace. By the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification. There is no exceptions here. At the condemnation, as the condemnation came upon all, so the justification comes upon all. Christ has tasted death for some men. For every man. Oh, my friends, it was every man that sinned in Adam. And so Christ was given for every man. Because the many that, affected, that were affected in Adam are also the many that are affected in Christ. Because Christ became the second man. The second representative of the human race. And because he lives, we live. And so he was given for all men. He tasted death for every man. Nay, he has given himself to every man. You have him. You have him. Take him. He gave himself for you. He became as we are. He became us. In as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also took part of the same. That through death, he might set us free and release us who through fear of death have all our lives been subject to bondage. Take him. He is given to you. He is the free gift. Take him. A gift is only worth anything if you take it, open it up. My wife's birthday was yesterday and we gave her some gifts. And if you took those gifts and, uh, and put them underneath the bed and forget about it, what, I don't care how much money we spend for the gifts. It means nothing. The gift is worthy, but to that person, they don't care. The free gift has come upon all. The fact that it is a free gift is evidence that there is no exception. Every human being, it doesn't matter what they look like, where they come from, what they speak like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, my friends. No exceptions means no exceptions. We're talking here about right versus might. 
in our culture nowadays, there is might being, being used to push people one way or the other, to ostracize people. During the pandemic, we saw the, the, the people, people became so, so antagonistic towards one another. But Christ was given for every man. He is the gift that was given to all men. And he gives justification of life to all men, if only they would take it. But here's the thing, my friends. There's not the slightest reason why every man that has ever lived should not be saved unto eternal life, except that they would not have it. So many spawned the gift offered so freely. How do you treat God? How do you treat the gift? As we, as we come to a, a close, we have a couple more slides to go through. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint. How, how, how many of you have hope? Hope, hope does not disappoint, friends. Because, because the love of God <laughs> has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You see, you see, you see, you see, the love of God, to love God is a, it's a gift of God. And the Holy Spirit is given to us that we would in turn love God who first loved us and gave himself for us. Romans 8, 24, for we were saved in this hope or by hope, but hope that is not sin is hope, but hope that is sin is not hope, excuse me. For why does one still hope for what he has sinned? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait with perseverance. Christ came that we may have hope. In him we have hope. The Holy Spirit pours down the love of God in our hearts that we would see Christ as our only hope. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat or Independent or whatever you are. No man in this world could give you hope. Because they all deal in might. But Christ deals in, in right. And therefore, he is our hope. And our only hope. Our only hope. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abound, grace. Grace much more abounds. The much more abounding grace of, of Christ. Now, we're going to talk about this tomorrow, too. And we're going to develop it in more detail. But, but does sin abound? Does sin abound, poor people? Does, does, it, does it abound in copious measure? Sin abounds. <laughs> but for my friends, grace, hallelujah, grace much more abounds. Grace overwhelms and just totally just demolishes sin. We are sin abounds. Grace much more. So that the sin has reigned in your mortal bodies, so grace might reign through the right doing, through righteousness, through eternal life in Christ Jesus. Our last slide, and then we'll be done. Desire of Ages, page 19. For coming to dwell, by coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and angels. He was the word of God. God's word made audible. Do you hear him? In his prayer for his disciples, he said, I have declared unto them thy name, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. But not alone for these earthbound, earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is a lesson book to the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look. And it will be their study throughout the endless ages. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self 
sacrificing love. And the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven. That the love which seeketh not her own has its source, has its source, has its source in the heart, in the heart of God. And that in the meek and lowly Christ is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in light, which no man can approach unto. Our friends, may God help us. May God help us because, because he is light and he dwells in light. Who among us can stand in everlasting burnings? In Christ we can. Because he's our all sufficient Savior. Shall we pray? Father, all to thee we freely give. We would ever love and trust you, not because we have this love in ourselves naturally, but because the Holy Spirit has poured out your love in us. And so, dear God, we thank you for speaking to us once again. And we thank you that you're going to speak again to my brother Kelly. Bless our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name.